Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Matt Munger and this is The Bible Was Written Backwards. In my last video, I got into the Genesis 1 creation account and looked at the way that there are parallels with the Babylonian creation account found in the Enuma Elish. Now, I purposefully didn't get into the Genesis 2 and 3 parts of creation because basically there are two different creation accounts in the beginning of Genesis. The one that's in Genesis 1 and then the one in Genesis 2 and 3. So in this video, we're going to get into some of that. Now in Genesis 1, we see that everything is structured within a seven-day frame. There are things created on each day and the items are specified. Now what is interesting and what is different between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and 3 is that things are made in a different order. In Genesis 1, we saw that on day 3, the plants came about. On day 5, the fish and the birds. And on day 6, first the animals and then humans. So when we look at the beginning of Genesis 2, what we see is that the order is completely different. So here's the text from Genesis 2, 4-7. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet on earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the earth. Then the Lord God formed man. We could get into other stuff. Um, there are linguistic differences that are very clear for a reader of the Hebrew text. There are stylistic differences. There are also theological differences. But for now, let's just use the order to establish that what we have here is, is basically a different way of thinking about creation. Now, what we're going to see is that the, there are a bunch of ideas in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 uh, which look at different texts which f talk about the creation of different things in different ways than we saw in Genesis 1, but that also are looking back at ancient Near Eastern ideas, traditions, and texts. So what I want to do in this video is look at the creation of man and woman. Uh, I'll do another video on the idea of the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Life, working the ground, that kind of thing. So for now, we're just going to focus on how man is created. So let's get back to the text before we, before we get into anything else. Because after it says, then the Lord God formed man, we see, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. What we see here is an idea of God forming man like he's working clay. He's taking something from the ground and he forms him and breathes life into him. So there is this idea of the body of being made from the earth. We find a wide variety of texts that have this kind of imagery in the ancient Near East, but I think we only have time to look at a few. We'll start with some of the oldest stuff and, and work our way forward. One of the most interesting examples is the Sumerian uh, text called the Song of the Ho, um, the, the gardening instrument. And this is from the end of the third millennium BCE, so we're talking uh, around the year 2000. And here we read about the way that humans are made uh, from clay. Where the flesh sprouts, he set this very hoe to work. He had, its, uh, had it placed the first model of mankind in the brick mold, and his people started to break through the soil towards Enlil. So, People are made just like bricks. They're pressed into a mold, they are formed, and then they apparently start to grow like plants out of the soil and become human. So another text that depicts the forming of humankind from, from clay is the Sumerian story called Enki and Ninmach. This is attested mm, the first half of the second millennium, so sometime before 1500 BCE. And here, the god Anki, so the, the Sumerian god of, of water and generally a very popular guy in the, in the mythologies, he sets about finding a solution to one of the big, big problems that the gods had in the ancient world, namely that they were just tired of working. So they have too much to do taking care of the earth, and 
this is one of the things that motivates the gods to create humans in these stories, that they want someone to take over their work. So Enki goes to his mother, whose name is Namu, and he asks her to mix the rest of the blood and flesh that, that she had left over from making him, from making Enki, and mix it with clay in order to form humans. So here's that text. After Enki had, in wisdom, reflected upon his own blood and body, he addressed his mother Nama. My mother, there is blood which you set aside. Impose on it the corvée of the gods. When you have mixed it in the clay from above the Apsu, the birth goddesses will nip off clay and you must fashion bodies. Now, we have to note here that mankind is made by forming clay and adding an element of, element of the divine. This corresponds pretty well with what we see in Genesis 2, where the clay, the body itself, is nothing before the breath of life is breathed into it by God. So the animated being, the self, comes only when the divine and the, and the material are, are mixed. The same theme is found in the Babylonian epic that we call the Atrahasis. The Atrahasis is a story that we'll definitely come back to in later episodes, but for right now what I'm interested in is the way Atrahasis uses the theme found in the Anki and Ninma story. Here, the Akkadian version, so the Babylonian version of the text, gives the name Ea to Anki, and this is the equivalent that we find throughout Akkadian literature. And Ea decides to make mankind to end the rebellion of the gods that has come about because the gods are tired of working. Now, they've been doing things like digging out the rivers and forming the mountains and generally toiling on the earth. And now the gods want a break and they want someone else to do the digging and the working. Now, Ea suggests that making humans could solve their problem. And the gods agree to the, the plan, and they decide to sacrifice a god, uh, one of the rebellious gods, so that they have something to mix the clay with to give it the element of the divine. So let's look at that text here. Let the midwife create a human being. Let man assume the drudgery of God. They, they summoned and asked the goddess, the midwife of the gods, wise mommy, will you be the birth goddess, creatress of mankind? Create a human that he bear the yoke. Let him bear the yoke, the task of Enlil. Let man assume the drudgery of God. So they slaughtered Ao Ilu, who had the inspiration in their assembly. Nin Tu mixed with clay with his flesh and blood. This, that same God and man were thoroughly mixed in the clay. From the flesh of the God, spirit remained. It would make the living know its sign, lest he be allowed to be forgotten. Spirit remained. After she had mixed the clay, she summoned the Anuna, the great gods, the Agigi, the great gods, spat on the clay. So this definitely brings us even closer to what we find in the Genesis 2 text. What we see is that here, clay is mixed with the divine element in order to give it this spirit of life. And then the gods even spit on the, on the clay before it becomes a full human. So these kind of connections that there has to be this active involvement of the gods and an element of the god for the human to be animate is, is really interesting. So this is something that we definitely see in the creation story in Genesis 2, where the clay has to have this element of the divine in it to be a whole being. This is also seen in the punishment that's given to Adam and in other texts, where the idea of that after death, the body goes back to the earth. So in Genesis 3.19, we read something like, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. That explains the creation of humans, doesn't it? They're looking back at these, these creation stories. Well, we forgot one thing. In Genesis 1, we read about that male and female, he created them. But in Genesis 2, so far, we just have the creation of man. Well, most of you know where this is going. There is, of course, a passage that describes the creation of woman in Genesis 2. What we see is that God begins by trying to find a partner for man. This is the frame of the creation of woman. God brings about all the plants and all the animals, and he parades the, the animals in front of the, the man, and the man gives them all names. But the goal of this is to find 
a mate, a partner for the man. Now, even though dogs are man's best friend, we see that there is not a suitable companion found for the man among the animals. So God has an ingenious idea. Genesis 2, uh, 21-23 says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Now, the background for this text is most likely found in another Sumerian story called Enki and Ninhursag. Enki we've met before, and Ninhursag is another name for Ninma. Now, Ninhursag means Lady of the Mountain. Now, we see her name in cuneiform here. The first sign is the Dingir, which is the sign that is placed in front of names of divine beings so that you know that this thing that's coming is the divinity. The second sign is Nin, which means lady or goddess or something like that, and it is prefixed to a number of names of god goddesses. The male equivalent to it is En, the E-N that we find like on Enki and Enlil and, and all these kind of names. So the rest of the name then is Hursag, which means mountains. So we have in this name, uh, Nin Hursag, the Lady of the Mountain. And Enki and Nin Hursag, the story, is actually made up of two separate stories where one is about the creation of people uh, with a variety of limitations. And, and then we have a second story, which is about Enki and his escapades with a number of his daughters. So it's the second story that I want to look at in this connection, though we, we might return to the first story in a, in a later video. Now, in this story, Enki impregnates Nin Hursag, and she gives birth to a daughter, who's called Nin Mu. One day, Enki sees Nin Mu down by the water, and as is pretty common with the gods, he can't help himself, and so he has his way with her. Now, Nin Mu becomes pregnant with uh, or by Enki and gives birth to a daughter whose name is Nin Kura. Now, the story repeats itself, and Nin Kura gives birth to another daughter by a a Enki whose name is Utu. And again, Enki finds her attractive and he just has to have her. There's a long section, a long poetic section, where Nin Hursag intervenes and seems to be. Uh, trying to get uh, Utu to demand some cucumbers and things like that in exchange for being with Enki. Um, but in the end, Enki and Utu do the deed, and the, this time Nin Hursag does not want the cycle to continue. So she removes Enki's semen from the womb of Utu and pours it on the earth. What happens is that trees sprout up. There are eight trees that grow, and Enki sees these trees and thinks, I need to eat those things. So Enki goes and he eats these things, and this makes Nin Hursag very, very angry. So she curses Enki and says that she will turn away her life-giving eye from him, uh, from him. Now, as Enki no longer has the life-giving gaze of Nin Hursag upon him, he lay dying and a fox appears. The fox uh, decides that he has a good plan for bringing Nin Hursag back. Unfortunately, the text is pretty broken at this point, so we don't know exactly what the fox does, but somehow it works. Nin Hursag comes back and looks upon Enki and sets about healing him, because he is, of course, poisoned by these eight uh, trees. So she sits beside Enki and asks him where he hurts. And for each place that he describes pain, she gives birth to a divinity that represents that place. And in the end, all is well, Enki survives, and eight new divinities are born. There are several interesting things that we see happening here, but the most entertaining of them is what happens with the seventh divinity that is born. The seventh divinity that is born uh, is given the name nin -ti. So let's look at that name here. We see that it begins exactly like nin uh, Hursag did. We have the Dinger and the Nin. So we have the divinity sign, we have the lady sign, and then we have this sign that is in Sumerian, T. 
Now T is a very interesting sign and word. One of the senses, uh, meanings of the word T is arrow. Now, if you think about it, you can kind of see the arrow uh, form in this sign. It makes sense. Another meaning is rib. So in this text, in the Enki and Ninhursag text, it's their meaning the lady of the rib. She was born to heal his rib, and then that is her designation. But Ninti is already known. So she is a goddess that appears in other tales and in other lists of divinities. And that is because her name actually means something else, which brings us full circle back to the creation account in Genesis 2. Uh, because the other meaning of the word T is life or giver of life. Now, the reason that this brings us full circle is that the Hebrew name for Eve, Chawa, literally means life or giver of life. So what we have is the biblical first woman, the giver of life to all the people of the earth. She is also the lady born of the rib, connecting both meanings to the, the Sumerian Dinger Nin Ti. So this is a really fun and, and deep way that the writers of the creation account were playing on ancient, uh, ancient Babylonian Sumerian literature. And if we accept the Sumero-Akkadian background of this Hebrew literature, it's very likely that the scribes were, were actually doing this on purpose, making a tale about the giver of life in the Hebrew story and her creation from the rib. So, Basically, we have a lump of clay, and we have a, a spirit being blown into him, and we have a rib that becomes the giver of life. And all this might be just fanciful ideas of where people come from, but I think that it's more interesting when it's seen as the way in which Genesis 2 is looking backward at the older traditions and texts and weaving them into the growing Hebrew story.